today what we're going to be trying to focus on is making sort of a taller form that's enclosed at the top. So we're going to start out the same way as always, right? Making my little round on all sides sort of potato shape. Let me get my wheel head dampened. Be nice if this was secure too. There we go. And we're going to center this. Two pounds of clay here. And I'm going to kind of speed through some of the parts that we've been doing over and over again, right? But again, centering, all I'm doing here is squishing everything up towards the top and then squashing it back down on top of itself and then making a jig with my chair karate chop. I usually do that a couple times. So we're coming it up, pushing it over so it rolls under my hand. Switching sides, pushing in that direction. Your bat uh, has jiggle like this too. If you can hear their chick, 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 chick. Uh, the way I get rid of that, because that's like kind of inevitable, right? Like that's not something wrong with your wheel head or your bat pin so much as it's just like your bat is kind of loose on there, right? Uh, I just keep a lot of downward pressure with my left hand on the actual bat itself, and that'll prevent it from clickety clacking all over the place. That's kind of just like an inevitability of using bats. Like they're great for if you're throwing plates or things like that, but you also do have to work around their shortcomings. So just finishing off with some chair karate chop there. We're gonna come in with my finger guns. Go down at a 45 degree angle. I'm starting to get a little bit of drag here, so I'm gonna put a little bit more moisture on there. I'm gonna then take my fingers and sort of fill in that hole that I made there. And I do want this, I'm kind of thinking of this as just like the same base steps as throwing a cylinder, right? I am going to want it to have a flat bottom and then corners. Finger guns, I'm going to flip them sideways, I'm going to make a claw and pull that claw towards me. I'm trying to keep the base as flat as I can muster. Yeah, so I, that, all I basically did in the middle there was just like do a little compression thing here just to reestablish how flat it was because I noticed it was starting to go to like rise up a little bit as I was pulling it out. So all I did was just reflatten it. So now I'm going to basically do that same thing with the sponge, right? Where I'm compressing back and forth the very bottom here so that we don't get any S cracks. All right. Get this all saturated. I'm then gonna start doing pulls. First pull is really just to move this from being uh, like V shape into being more of a cone shape because we're going for cylinder, which means we need to try to pull a cone, right? And I'm gonna gouge under here a little bit, try to get some of that clay out. And then fingers squeezing together, even pressure, easing up on the pressure as I get towards the top. Doing a little mini chair karate chop here to compress the lip. Now it's kind of just a rinse and repeat, right? I'm gonna do a couple of these with the sponge just to get like a lot of that, as much of that clay out of the corner as I can. Starting by like making a gouge underneath so I can then pull that sort of shelf of clay up. off on the pressure as I get towards the top. And then I compress the lip after every single pull, just to be fair. See how much clay we got down here. I might be able to do one more muscle pull and then we're gonna have to switch to fit this fingers. So if you have your lip that starts out real sharp, you have a tendency to just make it sharper and sharper and sharper. A really sharp lip eventually, if you put too much uh, stress or duress under it, will like split apart. Um, so you wanna compress the lip throughout the whole process so that it stays kind of chunky. And then at the very end, you establish it to be like whatever lip shape you want. But yeah, if you have a really thin lip the whole way through and you keep pulling it and pulling it, it'll start to split apart because there's not a lot of structural integrity there. So let's do one more pull. You can't just like take graham cracker crumbs and like kind of toss them into your pie crust. You gotta really, you have to compress them. You gotta smash them. Yeah. Do you have to do your muscle pulls 
with the sponge? No, I, some people do this with this part with a knuckle. Oh. Some people do it, yeah. It's just hard to move that much clay with just the pad of your finger, right? So I like the sponge because it's a wider surface area and it's also like a lubrication reservoir. You know what I mean? But like whatever works for you is what you should do. Some people like claw and pull up that first couple. Some people use the palm of their hand. Like really depends on how much clay you're using and what you're comfortable with. That's just what I do. That's what I find to be the easiest. All right, now I'm gonna try to do a couple dexterity pulls. All I'm doing is getting as much clay out of this corner as I can. And then you guys can see like what my thumb's doing over here where it's jumping up the whole side of the pot and holding onto my inside hand. That's so my hands are always connected and working in unison, right? And all I'm doing here is just like spending more time than I probably need to to try to get this as thin as possible because I'm gonna wanna do as minimal of trimming as I can because I'm gonna trim it sitting up. I'm not gonna actually flip it upside down. Which you can do, but you have to like a, have what's called a chuck to do it, where you basically like throw a waste piece that matches this angle. You know what I mean? It's just like kind of a pain. So what I do is I leave things attached and then I trim them upright, which we will go over. So as you're doing this too, if you notice your top start to flare out a little bit, this whole process is called uh, collaring, right? What we're basically doing is while the wheel is spinning, I'm taking sort of a, a what is that, hexagon shape with my fingers, right? And I'm basically choking the neck here and squeezing up as I do and then rising up with the pot. What we're trying to do is pr prevent that like top from flaring out like this and being more in shape is what we, or shaped inward is what we're looking for, right? So before I make the top enclosed like this, I do have to make sure that all the water is out of the inside now because I'm not gonna get another chance to do that, right? So now when I do add water to the pot, I'm only adding water to the very outside, right? So I'm just gonna do that a couple times. Choking in. And you can see there, right? Like my hands are still kind of doing that hexagon shape, but it's more of a, I don't know, thing like this. Some people will do it with uh, their very knuckles, right? Whatever you're comfortable with. I find that doing this is the easiest when I rise up with it. So something to think about as you're doing it, uh, sort of the antithesis of when we're throwing a bowl, right? Where like however thick this lip is, as it gets wider, it's gonna get thinner, right? When I choke things in, they're gonna add thickness to it, right? Because I'm taking a wall that's this big and then squeezing it in, all that clay has to go somewhere. So when I do that, that means I just made this whole section of my pot much thicker. So what I have to do is after every couple choke-ins I do, I do a little pull to try to thin that out. Reason being, if this part's really heavy and it's uh, on like a shoulder like this, there's no support here because this is thin, but this is really heavy, it's gonna want to slump in, right? So when you're enclosing forms like this, a lot of what you're doing is trying to make the pot not kind of collapse into itself. I'm gonna add some water to only the outside. Choke in again. Rise up with it. Sort of inevitably when you do this too, your top will get a little wonky, right? Uh, what all I do there is just take my needle tool at some points when it starts to feel like it's gonna throw me off. And I come in from the outside and cut off that wonky bit. Like so. And we'll recompress. And we'll repeat the process. Just re-throwing this out because it got a little thicker. This is how you would make like a uh, traditional like bottle shape or some kind of bottleneck base, any sorts of jugs, things like that. We'll start there. And now I'm gonna go through and just do some shaping. Just cause I think I like a more sort of uh, angular vibe to these as opposed to sort of like a smooth, consistent curve. You have your point side down, not the flat side. We can do either. Oh. But if, if I have my flat side down, it only lets me go directly vertical. This has a slight tilt to it, so I like to use the point side so I can tilt with it. All I'm doing here is basically trying to make this wall part straight, and that's great. Ooh, can you guys see yeah, it? Yeah, this yeah. is starting to go flat, right? That means I gotta come in here. So this whole process, is really just trying to make that part not get flat. 
So all I'm doing there and there is just with my fingers sort of lifting that part up again, right? But yeah, this is the whole struggle of doing this. So now I'm gonna come in here and try to compress that. It's thin right here. What's that? Yeah, right? shit down. Everybody okay? So the, the flatter you try to get that uh, sort of angle that it comes in, right, the more likely it is that it's gonna go like and sort of sag down. So what I try to do, as you can see on this one, is keep sort of an upward slope there just because structurally I feel like that has more strength. Um, and I, then I hopefully won't get quite as much sag. And I'm just gonna put another flat in here. Compressing it makes it stronger also. Yep. So I really just want to rough out the shape. A lot of when I'm doing something like this, a lot of the shaping actually takes place in the trimming section because this is much easier to deal with than like a super wet floppy thing that wants to fall on it, right? So I'm going to get it roughed out to the shape I want and then I'm going to deal with it more once it's a little drier and a little more stable. I think we get to... I don't know, about here. This gives me like some idea of when I am gonna trim it, what I'm gonna to wanna to do. And then I'm going to address the lip real quick just cause it's really wonky. Trying not to put any downward pressure cause I don't want this to sag. Mostly what I'm doing is just sort of rounding that out. And it's not a drinking vessel, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to have that sort of drinking edge to it. Oh yeah, a form that's uh, that's enclosed in a little bit up top, and then I will also go over now how to trim this shape down so that you can get it uh, to be a little bit more refined. Does anyone have any questions? Before you get to this step, a few steps back, and you were making kind of that shape that looked like a little flower pot base, a little, like a yeah, little uh -huh. base. If you didn't want to go geometric and you wanted it to be kind of that thing would you just stop there as long as there was no water in the bottom yeah as long as you had cleaned it out if you just wanted like a smooth sort of curve the whole way through that kind of classic uh you know where you put a little daisy in it yeah or totally i know exactly what you're talking about yeah yeah you can absolutely do that uh, the ribbing is all just uh things that i do because i aesthetically like the like look of sharp. angles like sharp angles better but that's all your taste you know what I mean? okay cool awesome guys cool uh, I'm gonna pop this one off, I'm gonna put this one back on, and then I'm gonna trim it, right? And you guys can see, like, I didn't wire under, I didn't do anything like that. All I tried to do was keep everything as uh, sort of dried off as I can. That way it dries a little bit faster. Uh, the sort of dried out version of the thing we just did, right? All I did here was I made the shape, I lightly covered it with a cloth, right? Because I wanted it to dry somewhat, but I didn't want it to dry all the way out to bone dry. Because I did still want to sort of uh, reevaluate these curves and these shapes up here as well, right? If I had just sort of left it uncovered, the bottom would still be good to trim, but the top would be a little bit too dry for me. So I lightly draped it like that. So all I'm gonna do here, and I, this is just still left on the back, like I said earlier, from the, uh, from the throwing stage, because I do wanna trim the very bottom. But I think I'm gonna start with the sort of shape going on up here, just to really refine it to be what I want. Because I ended up with like a little bit of like kind of sloppiness or like little goopy bits that aren't my favorite. I'm just going to spend some time cleaning this up. I notice sometimes when I'm trimming it, there'll be something either, I don't know, it's on the pot or on the trimming tool where it it's leaves a line. Yeah, so that's the grog that's in your actual clay. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Like, you can get rid of that by burnishing your pot with like a red rubber rib. Um, but like, I actually kind of like that look. I think it gives like a little bit of surface inconsistency that I, that I enjoy. So all I'm doing here, I mean, it's the same concepts as if you were like trimming the bottom of a pot, right? Except you're doing it when it's upright, which is a little bit easier, honestly. So all I'm gonna do here is establish some sort of corners just for aesthetic vibe. Kind of the whole flat, yeah, sort of the whole flat surface. I'm just not using a ton of pressure because like this part I do know is thin, right? When you're trimming the bottom of the pot, you kind of have free reign to sort of just like 
take as much clay as you want because you know when you're throwing it, like, oh, my corners have a lot of give there, right? This whole piece is thrown relatively thin, so there's not a lot of give at all, so I'm just being a little more dainty with my movements. But I do still want to establish nice, like, hard lines there. So I'm just gonna spend some time cleaning these up. And really, it's where these two angles meet that I, that I need to get sharp. This dried out for, uh, I threw this yesterday. Okay. So, yeah, like 24 hours, I would yeah. say, roughly, yeah. But like with a cloth draped over it so that the top didn't get super, super dry. Just a regular cloth, not plastic. No, I didn't put plastic. I use cloth because it does the same thing as plastic, but it allows some air in, whereas plastic a lot of times doesn't allow any air. It's so funny, like the point of throwing up standing is to like not kill your back like bending <laughs> over all the time, right? I cannot trim without getting like super, super close to it. I don't know what the deal is. Around there seems good. And like, I'm, you guys can see, I'm not doing a ton. I'm really just kind of refining the shapes I made earlier because that way I don't have to be as particular in the throwing stage when things are sort of harder to do, right? Like this is a much easier stage to, to do these things and establish these sort of curves and stuff that I like just because I have more wiggle room. So like most trimming, there's a lot of just fussing about, right? Trying to make things look clean. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time. I'm pretty happy with the top shape here. All it is is basically just a cleaned up, refined version of what I had already. And I'm gonna take just a damp finger, sort of round things out again so they're not quite so egregious in their sharpness. And then I'm also gonna like spend some time once this gets to bone dry, like cleaning it up too. So I don't have to be super, super concerned with any like little goobers or you know things I have going on there, any burrs, right? So now what I'm gonna focus on is trying to get this curve down here as clean as I can and giving it a slight undercut on the bottom so that it doesn't feel quite so heavy, right? And I do sort of like this, this subtle curve that goes like in and then back out. So I'm gonna try to keep that. You can see, like, I'm not removing a ton of material here. When I get towards the bottom corner, I know that I have a little bit more wiggle room, so I will use a little bit more tool pressure. But my walls are relatively thin already, so I don't want to put too much pressure on at the time. And all I'm doing here is sort of just refining that shape a little bit with a little bit more pressure on the very bottom corner because the very bottom corner is always a little bit heavier than everything else. So I'm pretty happy with that curve. Let's stop it and take a look at it. And you can see I have a bunch of those little lines where like little pieces of grog caught and dragged. I honestly like kind of like those. I think it makes it look interesting. So I'm gonna leave those. And all I'm gonna do on my very bottom corner here, to give the pot some lift. Let's get this going at like a medium wheel speed. So all I'm gonna do is sort of take my, my uh, trim tool like this and I'm gonna gouge it in just a smidge so that we can establish that bottom curve that I want. Get rid of some of these scraps here. See how we like that. I want that to be a little bit more severe. Just because this is such a small element, but it does add so much uh, like visual lift to a pot where it makes something that like looks heavy not look heavy anymore. Bring this up a little bit. Soften it just a smidge. And then we'll reestablish that sort of straight line there. 
Like honestly, yeah, that, that'll probably do us. Let's uh, clean up that gouge I just made. This is still pretty wet and goopy in here, so I'm just being careful not to go too severe with my tool pressure at the time. I think we might call it there. And if you did want to sort of get rid of those, any of those weird little marks, right, that are on it, uh, Mud Tools makes these red rubber ribs. They're really great in compression and burnishing surfaces, right? So if you want something that feels really smooth on the outside, these are great for that. Is it just a light pressure? Or? Yeah, I'm not using a ton of pressure. And the more pressure you use, like the sort of cleaner your pot will be, but this will also burnish your, and your like whole surface. It's almost like sealing the molecules of the clay. You can do the same thing with your finger, or like especially your finger in a plastic bag is really good for this. What all I'm doing is sort of softening everything. Cool. Right around there. Not a whole lot different, but like uh, enough visual difference that like it matters to me. You know what I mean? And that's the trimming stage. So all I'm gonna do now is cut under it. And then what I'll usually do is sort of with the, some part of my hand, let's just do it. Let's just do it live actually. I'll, uh, I don't want it to be completely flat on the bottom because a flat surface is harder to get perfectly flat. Usually when we trim, we have like just a ring that we have to get uh, perfectly flat, which is much easier. So the sort of cheater way to do that is to just sort of bevel the sort of very, very interior in with the soft pad part of your, pan, uh, of your hand. That way when it sits on a table, it's only sitting on this outside edge, which is much easier to get flat. So just like that, I'll let this set up. And then I will clean up the bottom corner a little bit where it's got little short bits once it's bone dry. We have a cute little jug.